Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Turning Towards Life. This is Lizzie and Justin. And we are here one more time again, miraculously, in this series of wonderful conversations between us, where we enter into uncharted territory each week with one another. And thankfully, there are all these amazing humans, Justin, who have created these sources, sometimes seemingly just for us. <laughs> and that we get to bring them and see how this goes so for anybody who would like to read along as we talk about this as we read the source you can always find the source on turning towards.life and just to say as well you can sign up by email to receive this conversation in your email box each week if you go to turning towards.life it's really clear how you can do that um what else is there to say this week i'm feeling really really glad of our practice Justin the kind of sanity in the in the midst of all of our lives that these conversations create is like gold to me and I can feel myself kind of entering into the space each time and I'm really grateful for that and also grateful for the range of sources that comes here and and I've read this before and it's one of those ones that we have frequently where I think you must have talked about this before and yet we haven't. <laughs> so it feels really lovely to, to be welcoming this, this thought in this beginning point in, I'm really grateful Justin to you for having this seemingly endless bank of things. Um, in my mind, Justin, I'm the one scrabbling around each week trying to find a source and you've got this organized library of things ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me who's going, oh, what are we gonna do this week? So anyway, my fantasy is that I could be like you and have a library already laid out. But as it happens, I rely on the universe serving me things and my uh, search ability when we when we need sources. But I'm just grateful that we both have the, the wherewithal and the connectedness to be able to find things each week that feel appropriate. And, and not everything is appropriate. You know, I also noticed that certain things I read, I think, no, that's not what we're about. And certain things I read and I think, oh, that's us, that's us. So it's interesting that we've both got that discernment that we can bring things that work for the conversation each time. Well, you think I have a big library. <laughs> but as it happens, this has been around for a long time because this, uh, this piece by David W. Orr, I don't know how I first came across it, but it had such an impact on me. So this one is one. I also do have a little library, but it's not a very big one. <laughs> so this has been, this has been uh, hanging around for a long time and I'm just starting to read He's written some books and he's written lots of articles and um, I was so touched this week I, I came across not this quote something that David Orr had written saying that all education is environmental education that we we learn um, so much about what the kind of world we live in is by what we get brought into contact with in a, particularly in the very formative stages of our learning mm -hmm. and what a tragedy it is given the, the, the nature and the scale of the difficulties we're facing in the world at the moment that more of us weren't brought into contact with the forests and the woods and the, and the streams and the fields and the ground mm. and you know all of these things we we got um separated from it and that, that really so I might find the piece that's about that for another time mm. but they had known this for a long time so it seemed really obvious to bring it back so um I'm feeling very grateful this morning for the uh the complete uh high wire act that this is that we don't know what we really don't know what kind of conversation we're going to have and I learn so much from our conversation every time I uh, I really feel myself being changed in the midst of it and uh, not having a plan and then not editing ourselves afterwards not going back and crafting it into something that's in bite-sized chunks and all of these um kinds of things I'm just watching you getting brought a drink How tea, my mom <laughs> I'm appreciating that because because that is what real human conversation is like you know when we actually speak to one another it's not packaged and edited and you know all the bits where we don't know what to do taken out that we've committed ourselves to doing something that's very real that's not shiny but is I know is deeply deeply meaningful to us and to many other people and uh, people keep on telling us and also people keep on telling other people about this conversation because there's mm. something healing about it very often for people um so I'm just feeling glad that we don't sit and chop it up into chunks and edit it and 
you know, put jingles on either end and, you know, all of that kind of throw, stuff. Throw away the ones where I'm particularly dishevelled. Throw away the dishevelled ones or the ones <laughs> where we don't know what we're talking about. All of it, all of it stays, everything stays in, everything's included, everything's welcome. Yeah. So uh, I pulled together two, um, two things from David W. Orr and put them together and I actually don't know what, where in his work each of these come, but they seem to belong together. And I will uh, read them now. The plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people, but it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage, willing to join the fight, to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities have little do with uh, little to do with success as we have defined it. What can educators do to foster real intelligence? We can attempt to teach the things that one might imagine the earth would teach us. Silence, humility, holiness, connectedness, courtesy, beauty, celebration, giving, restoration, obligation and wildness. Thank you, Justin. The plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people, but it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage willing to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities have little to do with success as we have defined it. What can educators do to foster real intelligence? We can attempt to teach the things that one might imagine the earth would teach us. Silence, humility, holiness, connectedness, courtesy, beauty, celebration, giving, restoration, obligation, and wildness. That's great hearing you read that back, Lizzie. So I know why I picked this now in I mean, there's a lot, hundred reasons. Um, but why these these two two parts? What's really striking me in hearing you read them is because um, David or is asking us big questions about two words that we take for granted. So one is success, and the other is intelligence. And um, I suppose I had been around some conversations recently with some people um, who had been talking about successful people. Oh, he's very successful or she's very successful. And I noticed, it wasn't hard to see, that the predominant definition of success that was in the conversation was either they'd made a lot of money, so they had lots of resource that they had amassed for themselves, or they had become very well known. So they had a very wide reach and the conversation didn't include anything about what seems to be a much more important question, which is um, what kind of person are they? Mm. And in a way, maybe in these times that we're living in, we're, we're struggling, we're in the, we're right in the tension between the stories we have about what it is to be human. So we've built a world in the West particularly, and it's sort of, it's colonized the whole world in one way or another that the only way to think about what success is is to do with how much you have how much you manage to amass where you know high how high up the pile you get to be is the definition um which has served the few people who've managed to get to the top very well um but in the in the process it's really uh, failed to help us with what's most humane that's really called for because that becomes secondary it's like being successful in a particular way. And today it also might be the number of TikTok followers you have or, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And I can feel myself so deeply subtle as you were reading these qualities, the kinds of people that we need. And of course, it's not other people that we need to be that, it's also ourselves. 
what is it to, to learn whatever age we are, or however deeply or far we've walked a path, whatever the commitments we're in the middle of, nothing prevents us from asking the question, how do I become more of a peacemaker, more of a healer, more able to restore, more able to tell stories that are life-giving and more able to love? Mm. It seems so straightforward to me that whatever else we do in the world, and there are lots of unresolved questions about how to organize government and how to organize society and how to, that those are true always because they're, because they're so deeply connected with what it is to live a life of human dignity and care. So I feel greatly moved by the, this call to moral courage to do whatever we can to make the world more habitable and more humane around us. And what a relief it is because the truth is, I got colonized by the stories of success too. And I still have parts of me, shame parts, that look at other people who made a bigger pile or got better known or have a shiny podcast that reaches a million people rather than hundreds of people or I can feel the, the shame parts of me that are caught up in that story that come up. There's lots more to say about the second part, but I'm going to stop for the moment. I'm just going to say, I want to hear what you have to say. Mm. Oh my gosh, as I'm sitting here, Justin, so it's listening to you and also feeling into the the context that we're in at the moment in that we're in the united kingdom both you and i live in in around london and four days ago our queen died and this whole process for me so i i obviously have never known anything other than queen elizabeth ii as our monarch and royalness has not been kind of like a big part of my life or anything i you know, it's just kind of there. And with Queen Elizabeth dying on, I think it was Thursday evening time, and it's now Sunday, so very, very short time ago in 2022 we are. And reading these qualities, Justin, you know, I came in here not really thinking about that. But then as you were reading them, I was thinking, in these last few days, something has kind of come clear to me about leadership and about taking a, taking a place in the world that we would call, and I don't know the technicalities of all of this, but the word sovereign keeps going around, you know, this sovereignty, this kind of being a, being a, a leader, being somebody who stands at the center of things and has power and it's been really making me think about our own, like whatever each of our relationship to that is. And as you were reading these words of silence, humility, holiness, connectedness, courtesy, beauty, celebration, giving, restoration, obligation, and wildness. Not sure about the wildness part actually, but in all of the conversations about the qualities of the queen that have been there and also the qualities of our new King Charles III, there have been these qualities that have been emerging, which I've never really understood or looked at or read much about before. And of course, when someone dies, all of this stuff that is kind of in the implicit, suddenly people start saying things. And so we understand things a little bit more maybe. And I feel like, and, and so many comments, Justin, have been around, like, even if you're, you know, if you're a royalist or not, if you believe in the monarchy or not, this is a human being this woman in our time who, is, who has lived by obligation, by courtesy, by connectedness, by humility. You know, and of course we could critique all of the things that have happened in history, but in, in encountering her the way that I have and listening to all the people that knew her and feeling into the situation and the grief that's there as well, I feel like it's really brought home to me that there is a place, like a really, really crucial place for all of these qualities to live in each of us so that it's okay to be here. You know, you were talking about the connectedness of the, this second par paragraph and the first one. For me, it's like all of the things in the bottom half create a world that's habitable and humane. 
and, and without them like like if all we had was that definition of success that you were talking about which is to do with status and money and fame and all those things and the trappings of like the material stuff it wouldn't be okay like it wouldn't be humane to be here it wouldn't be habitable and so for us to be part of a world that builds and cultivates these qualities and where anybody can lead in this way you so anybody has their own royalness to them you know your your royalness justin is this kind of profoundly encouraging energy that has integrity and wisdom and settledness inside of it like and those are a few of what I think are your kind of royal qualities if you like to use the I don't even know what the word royal means but in this context it's like your king your kingness and my queenness what are the qualities of your kingness and what are the qualities of my queenness and they feel like that's what this is and I am um, I feel really moved by the whole process of what it's having me reflect on as I encounter this big, big shift in history. And goodness knows what it means for all kinds of different people. But for me, in my reflections, it's really brought home that the value, the really big value, the, the profound value of these qualities and how we really need it as humans. We really need these qualities to be beaming through us all the time in order for the world to feel habitable and humane. Gosh, that's so excellent. I'm loving hearing the way you're talking about it, Lizzie and I. I'm grateful for the, your, your bringing together of this moment in time and the queen and everything in, right into this conversation that feels so right, not just only time-wise, time but in terms of what's important here. And I got thinking about, yes, I, I was sort of having a similar thought about sovereignty, which I think when you said kingness and queenness, that we've got right to the heart of it, which is that we all have a kind of sovereignty if we'll take it. And it's not the kind of sovereignty that puts us as most of us anyway, as head of state of some country, but there is the opportunity for us to step into our own you know, capacity to inhabit something and own it and declare it and practice it and express it and say, this is mine. I have a way to be in the world and I have choice in it. I've got sovereignty over, over that. And in fact, um, Uh, in any situation, that's the choice that we have. That's the first thing, it seems to me. You know, and one of the things that David Orr is writing about, he's writing in the context of, you know, all the troubles that we know that we face. I was reading um, a, very, a very dispiriting, frightening article about climate tipping points yesterday. And I noticed myself thinking, gosh there's so much we can still do and the truth is none of us know whether we'll ma manage to do it or not we may or we may not the world may have be unchangeably changed in ways that are going to make things very very difficult or maybe there's lots and lots and lots, and lots we can do about it and, and we ought to do everything we can and in either of those situations our being our cultivating our silence humility holiness connectedness courtesy beauty celebration giving restoration obligation wildness storytelling restoring healing loving it doesn't matter how it goes that's called for anyway and indeed all of that might well help us build families and communities and societies that have a better chance of improving things but also have a better chance of taking good care of one another in all the difficulties so it doesn't seem to me that there's any question that this is what we should put central in our lives. And um, it's such a great question that you were asking about noticing in ourselves in one another what the kinds of kingness and queenness we already have that we can, we can cultivate and that we can recognize and call out in one another. So when you said those things about me, I was very moved. And 
was to feel committed as well. Like Lizzie sees all of this, I feel committed to continuing that, to not losing my contact with all of those qualities. So I think you, the other thing is, I think you're talking about the work that we do and what third space is for. And somebody asked me this the other day, somebody very important to me who I just met said, so tell me about the work that you do. And I found myself, as I often do, stumbling over words. The first thing I said was, well, it's kind of complicated to talk about. And it's like, oh, I always, mm -hmm. and I think it's, com I think the only reason it's complicated to talk, to talk about what we do in the coaching we do and what we teach and how we build community and how we do this podcast, this, this conversation and all of that, it's only difficult when I try and tell the story from the story of a world that needs more successful people. Mm. So I go, well, it's not exactly what, for example, if I want to talk about it as coaching, as kind of coaching where I'm you know, not trying, you know, I sort of have to say all the things I'm, we're not doing, or, or even actually, if I talk about it, sometimes I say, well, there's something really deeply healing and therapeutic about a lot of the work that we do. And then I have to distinguish, try to distinguish it from other modes, because what we do, even this conversation is the same and not the same. But today, I realise that what I want to say when someone asks me that question is I want to say what I'm really committed to doing, what we're doing is helping people become peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers and lovers. And to cultivate what the earth calls for from us, silence, humility, holiness, connectedness, courtesy, beauty, celebration, giving, restoration, obligation, unwildness and, and any other quality that allows us to step fully and generously and responsively into our lives. That, that's what we're up to. Mm. It feels really good to, to re, re find that kind of language for the set of commitments. Yeah. yeah I, I do have a, an interesting relationship to saying what it is that we do, because of course it's, there's complexity in it too. You know, there's nothing simple about what, what we're doing because it's to do with humans, which are profoundly complex systems. And so I love it that you found in this some straightforward, succinct something to say. Also, though, I imagine myself in your presence and me saying, what do you do? And you telling me that. And... The trouble with it is it would open up so much for me to hear that I wouldn't probably be able to reply to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. like if you told me that's what you did, I'd be like, <gasps> and um, so of course it, it, it opens so much just to say what it is that we do, which is part of the whole deal, isn't it? So I really appreciate that. And I, finally, what was arising as you were saying that too, is that we have like this ongoing you know, there's naturally occurring jokes in the, in our kind of family system where, you know, my sister and I will be in some some sort of mess of some kind with young children and logistics and whatever. And we will have, we'll look dishevelled, but have a nice cup of tea in our hands and the children will all be naked or something. And we'll say, this is success. We've reached the pinnacle. We've made it. Our work is done. <laughs> And of course, it has absolutely zero to do with the things you were talking about, the kind of normal traditional ideas of success. But it is a kind of in response to that as well. Like it wouldn't be funny if we weren't saying it in response to something that clearly this wouldn't be defined as successful because we're a bit of a mess and <laughs> we don't look like we've got ourselves together and we don't look slick. But for us, it is success because there's happiness and there's no one's having a an issue at that particular moment, which mostly everyone is, you know, when there's a family kerfuffle going on. And I feel like somehow it's really threaded through our work too, Justin, and, and the things that I'm inside of this, thankfully kind of humorous relationship to it all as well, of, you know, success is, is, is turned for me into something that's mine to define not uh and of course i can feel you know when i'm less resourced or feeling i don't know like under par in some way i can find myself comparing myself to people feeling envious feeling like i've lost it like i should have done more like i 
I just can't do what I should be doing. You know, all of those things come. But thankfully, and I guess this is part of our work too, Justin, that there is a kind of a way of que like profoundly questioning the soup that we're swimming in, which we've spoken about so much and turning towards life. You know, the, the context that we're in all the time is so impactful. And I think one of our core practices is, is learning to find language for the, for the noticing of that in all kind of, some things are obvious, some things are less obvious of all of the social norms and the contextual cultural current ways of defining things, which of course of this time in so many ways, where you suddenly go, oh, hold on a second. That doesn't have to be mine. You know, on this topic of sovereignty, I, I get to choose what's mine. So I get to choose that that's not the way I want to live or those aren't the standards that apply to this life. And however many times it gets said in the news or the magazines or the things that everybody reads. Firstly, I don't have to read those things, which I remember at one point was a complete revelation to me. It's like, oh, I don't have to pick up the magazine that's making me feel all those feelings. I can just not read it. So I feel like the sovereignty conversation has been threaded through like lots of things in, in our inquiries and in my life so that I, I get to be the one who makes that decision. No matter how many times the world tries to re-enroll me in something that feels really horrible and unhealthy for me, these days I just go, no, I don't, I don't read that. That's not something I would pick up and put into my system right now. And I really appreciate that that's one of our central practices, which is really understanding what's, you know, what's mine to say yes to, what's mine to say no to, and also noticing that, of course, historically, I've said yes to loads of things that aren't really healthy for a human being. And therefore, I am completely steeped in the education that I received and the, the environment that I grew up in and all that kind of thing. But I, I now have the, the sovereignty to use this current piece of language. I have the so sovereignty to question things and go, oh, so everyone thinks that this is what I should be. Is that true for me or not? What does it mean for me? So I love it that we're constantly trying to see through those things and articulate them so that we can then differentiate ourselves in our sovereignty, in our essence, in our, my queenness and your kingness gets to say, is that me or is that not me? And that there's content in the queenness and content in the kingness that might not come forth unless those things are really thoroughly questioned and seen for what they are rather than taken as a given or something. Mm. I find myself at this moment also wanting to say my queenness and your kingness. Too. Yes. Yeah, that's um, to this language of sovereignty is so great because it's really see it with with our queen who just died. That one of the things I would say about her, from everything I can tell, which of course is only a tiny portion of the life that she was, mm. was that she was someone who chose what to stand in. Yes. You know, which values to stand in, which ways of being to stand in. And, and of course, her position in the social constructs that we have particularly afforded her that possibility to say, I am going to, to declare, to be the one who declares, I'm standing here. I'm not going to be subject to, um, you know, the forces of the way people write about things, or I'm going to stand in this place. This is, this is where I stand. And that that's something that, that, we can't certainly control everything about our surrounding circumstances and sometimes we can't control anything about our surrounding circumstances but we always have the the opportunity to be self-sovereign in that way to go mm. here's what i'm going to pay attention to and here's what i'm going to value and here's what i'm going to practice and here's what in myself i'm going to cult cultivate we have that choice yeah. and um i'm really with what you're saying so i um I don't follow any kind of social media anymore because I noticed, just like you were talking about magazines, I noticed that what happens for me is exactly the thing. It 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 um it's it's it causes me injury because all kinds of things happening with me happen with me. I get I get comparative and I get sucked into things and I 
And I noticed that that's what was happening. I had a choice to go, well, just because everyone else is, and that's the way the world is, is that what I'm going to do? Or am I going to be self-sovereign and say, no, I want to stand somewhere that's quieter yeah. and uh, wilder in a way, and I certainly have more restorative. And that's, we have mm. endless number of choices uh, around how we do that. And I think that that's, um, I know that that's what we're deeply committed to in this conversation and in this work, like you're saying, Lizzie, is helping each of us find out what it is we're paying attention to and to, and to act in ways that are life-giving on what we pay attention to, what we receive and, and what we practice in ourselves. And it feels very important in a world that I think it's where we're in so, so in alliance with David Orr here. It's still so important in a world that will tell us all the time there is a particular way to be and it's this mm. even if it's hurts you even if it destroys you even if it eats you up yeah so i know we're coming to the end of our conversation justin but just to say as you were saying that that piece about you not being on social media and the choices that you make lead to restoration and or being sucked into something going you know you when you said that, I was feeling how important it is that you tell me that and that you, that's where you stand. Because as you said it, I thought, oh my goodness, I can see more clearly because you're doing that, because you're saying that to me, I can see more clearly all the choices that I make that don't lead to restoration. So I feel like we have to do this for each other. You know, we have to say where we stand we have to be the self-sovereign in order for other people to see what they might be missing in their lives as well and of course it doesn't sometimes there's dissonance there of like I might have attachments to my social media and that really triggers me to know that you're saying there's restoration outside of it and that maybe you know your suggestion of it in yourself brings something forth in me and so I have to be willing to go, oh my gosh, I can see that I'm feeling defensive about that. How interesting. So what, what would happen if I took away a thing, if I feel that defensive about just somebody saying that they don't use it or they're not on it or something. And so I can, I can feel how important it is for all of us to stand where we stand so that other people can have a chance even of not being sucked in because it's so it's so prevalent it's so the norm now and I, I don't have like much contact with it but I can I do know that there are moments where I think I don't know what to do I'm just going to look at my Instagram feed and just check check what check what's happening in the world or something in, in, a, in a moment of lostness and, and, and of course that does something, but it doesn't restore me, <laughs> which is probably when I'm feeling lost, restoration would really help rather than just some mindless, something to take me away from the moment. So I'm really grateful that each of us can stand in, in ourselves and that we are in, interested in that and cultivating that sovereignty because it really matters. I can tell that something just happened in me where I was, I, now when I'm lost and I reach for something on my phone, I might have your voice right there. I will have your voice right there saying restoration, restoration. And I'll have David all there too, saying beauty, wildness. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling really like, that's, a, that's one way that the world is humane and that that's a very, very kind thing to do, even though I might feel triggered by it or feel defensive about it or like I'm losing something that I'm clinging on to for dear life. The fact that wildness and restoration and connectedness is being invited by somewhere where you stand in terms of my life feels very, very important. There are so many things that you teach me that way too, Lizzie. That's what we all do. We teach one another this by what you say about yourself and the places you stand. 
and uh, my we, we my sort of closing thought is um and it's not even as simple as social media or not i mean the, the nuance and what i said is we're putting turning towards life out on facebook and linkedin and all kinds of things so i yeah it's not like i have no engagement with any of those things i suppose what i'm all attending to is exactly this question is what's restorative what brings me to life yeah so i noticed having a social media feed is the thing that does it so i just don't have a feed when i log into facebook i don't see any posts mm. so then i have choice am i going to stay here is there somebody who whose work i want to read is there something yeah. for me to say but i don't get into the being lost and then called into the sort of the scrolling through in the hope that something will make me feel better which it never ever 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 does Yes. And that's the question about restoration and holiness and beauty mm. that's the one for us all to be in I think what a joy to have be in this conversation I know. I know um thank you Lizzie and thank you everyone thank you Lizzie for your courage and your love and your straightforwardness and saying what's here that's such a gift and um for being such an excellent excellent friend and partner in this big endeavor that is inching towards our having completed five years of talking to one another just in three or four Amazing. weeks something like that that's when we'll get to that um and thank you everyone for being with us and all being well we will be back next week thank you everyone bye